So my kitchen and dining room floor is a six-year-old laminate that needed replacing from seams buckling and dents. I began, of course, by removing all the furniture in the room. Then I gave it a nice sweep and cleaning. In order to remove the room's trim, I used a knife to cut the caulk around my baseboards. Then I used a putty knife and a hammer to get in between the wall and the trim. Once I had a little space to work with, I used a crowbar to fully remove the trim from the wall. I also removed obstacles like heat registers and then used the same putty knife and crowbar method to remove other trim around the floor, as well as the transition pieces between the carpet in our living room and the flooring in the kitchen and dining. The laminate floor that was installed was a floating floor and so I got started on where the heat register was because it was already an open space I could begin to pull up the click together flooring. I also removed the foam underlayment that comes with many laminate floors. Don't forget when you're doing this process to move your appliances out of the way as the flooring often goes underneath them. Under the floating laminate floor was also vinyl tiles from the 80s. I decided to remove these as well. Then I was down to the subfloor. We vacuumed up all the pieces and debris, and then I sanded away any rough spots and sticky adhesive. When laying a floating floor, the first row is the most important. When sizing your first row, you want to measure the entire space that you'll be laying a floor divided by the width of the planks, and if the last row of flooring is going to be skinnier than two inches, you need to cut the first row accordingly. Use a straight line or a laser level as your jumping point to measure from frequently, ensuring your first row is laid straight and parallel to the line. A floating floor needs a quarter inch of space around all sides so it can expand and move. I used a piece of flooring between the wall on that side and then on this side I flipped the piece of trim upside down so the quarter inch part was keeping space on this entire side of the wall. To cut luxury vinyl plank flooring all you need is a square and a utility knife. Mark where you're going to cut and then make numerous scoring marks. Simply break the piece of flooring and then lay it in like so. Make sure that the ends of the row are longer than 8 inches where you start and where you end. When you have an obstacle, like I did with my heat register, mark around where you need to cut and then score that part deeply. It takes a bit of muscle and finesse to get a piece like this to break free from the flooring. Start each row of flooring with a plank a different length than the one before. You'll see here I made a tapping block from a small piece of the flooring. To tap, I flip it upside down so that it doesn't interfere with the click joinery of this type of floor. Make sure all your seams are very tight. Before each new row, I vacuum the area clean. Here's a great tip to make about half the amount of cuts. After each row, use the remnant of the piece you cut to start the next row. You will use more of your flooring and have less waste that way. So when you're measuring a plank to fit the end of a row, simply flip the piece of flooring the opposite way make your mark and then make your cut with the square and the utility knife. This way when you're done cutting you can just flip it and it'll be the right measurement to click into place. No tape measure required. When using your straight edge to make cuts on the flooring just put the metal square into the groove of the joinery system on these planks. It prevents the square from moving around and you'll get a very straight cut. Lay in the plank by attaching the short side first. Pick it up and come into the groove at a downward angle. Click together the long side of the plank by lifting up the previous part of the row. 
so you can get it at a downward angle as well, sliding it tightly together and then laying it flat. So I just did this process again and again throughout the entire floor in my dining and kitchen area. It was quite a tedious project, but I'm happy to say I was able to do it myself. By the end, I was getting accustomed to using my tiny tapping block after every single row to make sure the seams were extra tight. Before reinstalling the trim, I gave it a fresh coat of white paint as well as a new coat of stain on the quarter round around the base of our cabinetry. I also painted the underside of the trim on the wall, the wall color, so when reinstalling my job would look professional. I used a hammer to pound the nails from the trim back into the wall. Then I touched up the nail holes with paint. I reinstalled the quarter round with my brad nailer. To install the transition pieces between the living room and the kitchen, I inserted these large plastic screws into the piece and then used a drill with a quarter inch bit to drill holes for these screws to be pounded into. This process reminded me a lot of installing drywall anchors. After vacuuming up my mess, I installed it with a rubber mallet, tapping gently from one end all the way down to the other. That was the last step in the finishing touches on my beautiful new floor. Go ahead and click subscribe or share if you want to see more from Welcome to the Woods.